hello everyone and uh, just a second okay uh, please everybody uh, can mute your own mic so you can speak when uh, when you are asked to speak i request everyone to mute their mics or uh, the back end team can actually mute everybody else because uh, otherwise it is going to disturb us uh, hello and welcome to you all for uh, this session from med exam expert on uh, the preparation for part 3 preparation as we all know the next exam probably most probably will be held in november 2020 uh, unfortunately the may exam uh, has been cancelled but as we all know the preparation must go on as uh, any time uh, you know the anyways the exam is in november but you should be prepared now any time to uh, give this exam because uh, i'm sure there will be a big backlog this time uh, where the exam uh, the exam schedule is open and when the uh, when you fill the form for the exam uh, there will there is going to be a big backlog uh, i hope everybody who has been waiting will get a seat in the coming exam and is able to give the exam at that time so in the meantime uh, all of you should be ready uh, that whenever you get the seat for the exam you are able to give the exam with your full preparation i know it is disappointing for those who were preparing for may and it is very difficult for anyone to keep the momentum uh, for a long period of time uh, in the same manner and to keep your preparation at that optimal level uh but uh this is how it is the situation overall in the world because of covid has been uh very disheartening uh but anyways the life must go on uh so today I, we normally normally when we take uh, pre sessions we talk about introduction about the exam and how the exam is uh conducted uh i'm sure everybody of you who's attending quiz session knows about the exam pattern uh this time we have changed the webinar slightly differently so we'll just talk about mainly about the domains and then talk about some interesting topics uh we have a series of three webinars starting today so i'll be taking talking to you about domains for mrcg part 3 and uh talking about dealing with young adults so we talk about some difficult specific stations which should be prepared uh differently from the usual stations uh first topic today which we are doing is dealing with young adults uh this webinar will be followed by a webinar on sunday by dr mohammad hassan who will be talking about breaking bad news and doing stations on breaking bad news as you know that breaking bad news itself is a difficult situation to handle even in real life and even in exam scenario the third and final free webinar will be by dr sidra ali and uh, she will be doing another difficult and important situation on negotiating with the patient uh, and she will be doing sessions on that uh, even today we have a bit of negotiation with the patient in one of the sessions that we do we'll be doing two sessions after i talk a little bit of theory on this uh uh just to talk a little bit about the exam uh we all know the uh, i think uh, somebody's mic is on can everybody mute okay okay now it's better okay so uh you all know that it is going to be a circuit based exam uh, with 14 stations 
and one from each module so you should start preparing each module equally give equal emphasis to each module because uh, portion wise each module is going to be the same in the exam uh, so the course which we will be starting in july to 2020 and will go on till october 2020 it's the comprehensive course uh, which we have been running successfully uh, now from the last two years and uh, this comprehensive course uh, was the idea was born out of the fact because earlier we only used to have a short term intensive six weeks course before the exam uh, but then there were students who wanted a longer course uh, which was a more uh, slow sustained preparation kind of course uh, so the comprehensive course which begins in july will be like that uh, in which we will have multiple sessions each session will concentrate only on one module so you just prepare one module for 7 to 10 days uh, we talk to you about how to prepare that module and then uh, then do the stations only on that module so that will be how the course will run and there will be certain special sessions like a session on structured discussion there is a special session on various uh, how to make templates for various modules then we talk about difficult topics and then two stations on difficult topics as we are doing today so it will be a very uh, thorough extensive uh, course which uh, this time we have added some new things to it uh, so later on those uh, who want to join this course we will talk about the links uh, so let's begin talking about domain so we know it's a circuit exam and uh, you will get 14 stations each station is marked on various domains and uh, the marking of each domain in each station uh, will be two, one, and zero. Two is a pass, one is a borderline score, and zero is a fail. Each station will have three to four domains to test. So in the question, when it is given to you, uh, it is mentioned that you will be tested on how many domains, maybe three or four. Uh, very rarely, all the five domains will be tested in a particular station, but at least three to four domains will be tested. And for each domain, the marking, as I told earlier, the marking will be the same. Uh, and once you give full exam, they total all points from each station, from each domain, and then gives you a sum total. And so you have to pass in the sum total. So you, there is a specific cutoff for each exam, which is generally 62 or 63 is what I've seen in the last exams. Uh, if you pass that cutoff, if you can score that cutoff, you pass the exam. Uh, so you do not need to pass in each specific domain, but obviously you need to do well in each domain to pass. Uh, if someone is not able to clear the exam, when they give the result, then they tell in which domain that particular person was not able to score on par or score optimally. So each domain is important. Important uh, for us is to understand what each domain is all about. So that knowledge of what each domain signify, signifies and what uh, they expect from us when we, they talk about uh, domains is what we try to understand today. Uh, so just my, I, uh, I did not introduce myself to those who don't know me. I'm Dr. Pooja Sharma Dimri. I am uh, currently working in National University Hospital in Singapore. I am from uh, Delhi, a pass out from De Lady Harding Medical College. And I have been actively involved in teaching for a long, long time, starting from undergraduate and postgraduate students. I have written three books on uh, in gynecology, one on PCOS and two on laparoscopy. Uh, those who are interested, uh, we have a very good book on total laparoscopic hysterectomy. And I've been the lead mentor for uh, the Part 3 Med-Exam Expert course uh, since 2018. So uh, we started in August 2018 and 
you have run many successful courses for part three and uh, we started with the intensive course and now we have the comprehensive and intensive courses running throughout the year so nothing worthwhile is ever easy so we should always remember this saying uh, so we all know uh, how important this MRPOG degree is to us and I'm I know all of you have been passionately preparing for it and uh, we spend so much of our time and energy uh, for this whole MRCOG degree starting from part one, uh, part two, and then now part three. So it's a long drawn preparation. It's not easy, uh, but it is worthwhile. So it's difficult, but it is definitely doable. We all have done it and I'm sure uh, you all just putting a proper uh, targeted effort is what is important. That's, that's, the, that's the main term uh, you should remember the target the targeted preparation. It has to be very strategic uh, How you prepare you can spend so much of time and energy But if it's not targeted if it's not in following a particular strategy It becomes difficult to clear the exam uh, if you follow a particular strategy if you You know, know what to pay emphasis on how to prepare properly It's very difficult to not pass the exam uh, so this is how we try to uh, tell our students is how to actually prepare. The knowledge is always there. You all, uh, those who are planning to prepare for part three, have passed the part two, which I feel is the most difficult part of this MRCOG journey, in which you have to you know, learn a lot, understand a lot, and read between the lines to be able to solve those SBAs and EMQs. So if you have done that, Definitely the knowledge part is there, but how to apply this knowledge in communication is what this exam tests. So let's start with the domains. The first domain is on uh, information gathering. Now, uh, uh, information gathering is, looks very simple and uh, easy. Uh, that it's you know, taking the history and examination, uh, but it's not, and actually it is a easy to score domain. The important thing we should realize is that uh, this exam is, has a time constraint. You have to finish your whole station in 10 minutes. So you get a two minutes, uh, please mute your mic. Uh, so we'll, uh, I don't know, somebody has raised their hand, but I think we will take the questions at the end. But I will, in between, I will definitely keep asking and interacting with you. Uh, sorry. So information gathering, uh, the important thing, DP, please mute your mic. Uh, please mute your mic. So information gathering, the important thing what I, am, I want to emphasize is that you have 10 minutes. So you will have a two minutes reading time. You will be standing in front of the cubicle. That two minutes passes like seconds. You have to read the whole question and understand what the station is about. You should be, you know, have a pen and your pencil and paper in your hand and just write down the important points. But when you go inside, you have just 10 minutes before the bell rings and then you have to rush to the next station next cubicle to read the next question so when you talk about information gathering that has to in in your 10 minute station information gathering should be maximum four minutes if, if it's taking too much time then maybe four and a half minutes but you can cannot exceed that time because if you exceed five minutes for information gathering there is very less time for you to explain the management plan to the patient. Also, you have to keep in mind, you have to give at least one or two minutes time for the role player to speak because they may have certain things on their agenda in their script, which they may want to tell you. So you have to give that much time for the role player to speak. So if you take six minutes on history and two minutes, the role player talks, you're just left with 
two minutes to explain the management plan, which is not enough at all. You won't be able to complete or finish your station. So important thing is to, to make your history examination concise so that it finishes off in four minutes, maximum four and a half minutes. Now this information gathering includes history. Uh, so history has to be, uh, one is that the history has to be very structured. This is one of the things we find, uh, or most of the candidates find it difficult. In the initial and the beginning stages of preparation, uh, commonly the problem is that the history is not structured. So if you start thinking in the exam, oh, now what I have to ask, now this is the next question. If you keep thinking like that, you lose time. You don't have time to think in the exam. Most of the time, especially the history taking has to be very reflect. And that only comes when you keep practicing history taking again and again. So without any other person asking, the, all the questions should finish in two, two and a half minutes. So history, examination and investigation, all this constitute the information gathering. So that is all information you have gathered from the patient to actually form the diagnosis and to explain the management plan. So it includes history, examination, and investigations. So you do not do an examination in the exam. So actually you are not performing an actual examination, but you should be telling the patient that I want to examine you. What do you want to examine? I want to do an abdominal examination or I want to do a examination of the vagina. And then why you want to do that examination also has to be explained. You have to justify each thing you are doing. And if you want to do certain investigation on an ultrasound scan, so you have to tell the patient, I want to do an ultrasound scan because I want to have a look or see the womb and the ovaries, whatever. So you have to justify it. So all that information gathering is four minutes. When you start, so it should be very organized. And yes, then it should be targeted because the same history cannot be when you're taking a gynecological case and and vis a vis when you are talking in an obstetric case. So in an obstetric case, the history will be slightly different from a gynae case. The history in a urogynecological case of stress incontinence will be different from the history you take for a menorrhagia case. So that is a targeted history, but the basic structure remains the same. So you start with uh, open-ended questions. Can you tell me more about your complaint? And then you go on to the specific, like if it's a menorrhagia case, you ask about the, the regularity of the cycle, flow, frequency, and then you ask about post coital bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding and so on. So then you go from open-ended to close-ended questions. Information gathering also, uh, when you're so suppose, uh, 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 talking about investigations, so when you say, I want to do these particular investigations, if you have name the correct investigation, then the examiner will give you the in information in the form of the investigation report. So it's important for you to say that I want to do this. Okay. So, and whenever you're gathering information, you also have to have to be sensitive, especially if you're gathering information about addictions like alcohol, smoking, drug addiction, or you have, uh, you have, to, uh, you, have, you have to take sexual history. All these things uh, will require more sensitivity on your part. So information gathering also involves communication. So we'll talk more about uh, when we talk about communication with the patient. So that is about information gathering. So next domain is communication with patient and relatives. So now this is the key to the MRCOG Path 3 exam, the communication. The word communication is the most important part of the exam. So it's a exam of communication is what I call it. So now with the patient and relatives, okay, what do you do? Uh, you introduce yourself. So first is introduction of who you are and developing a rapport with the patient. So you say that, hello, I'm Dr. This, the registrar in the uh, clinic today. And then you ask the patient, May I check your name and age? So that is your introduction uh, to the patient. The other important points in communication are, as I talked about, sensitive communication. That means you have to be very sensitive and empathetic. 
so you have to sign post now when do you sign post you sign post when you have to give a bad news so breaking bad news involves sign posting uh, which you will do in another of the sessions this time so i'm sorry i don't have good news for you so this is a sign posting the patient understands that something is going to come and then you say that i am sorry to say that you have cancer of the womb so this is the sign posting secondly sign posting is also involved in things like asking sensitive questions like when you have to talk about alcohol or smoking or drug addiction you say that uh, i am sorry to ask you these questions uh, i know they may sound very intrusive but they i need to ask them from all my patients to decide the further management plan and then you say that do you smoke or take alcohol or any recreational drugs so there also you sign post uh then the other parts of communication are honesty when you have to explain anything to the patient like you are talk talking about you know a breaking bad news you have to be honest there are some complication has occurred in surgery you have to be honest so that also is a part of communication another important thing which when we start preparation we have difficulty is avoiding medical jargon so you have to talk in layman terms don't use scientific terms for everything uh try to uh convert scientific knowledge into layman law, uh, knowledge when you explain and this you can easily uh understand and learn when you do the patient information leaflet so uh it's said very often that when you start preparation for part 3 you should start reading the patient information leaflets so patient information leaflets not only will give you uh, layman terms for the common scientific term also it has all the clinical knowledge which you need to explain to the patient which is given in the guideline so it's a guideline written in patient's friendly language so we should always avoid medical jargon and then you can use some aids to explain in the form of diagrams Uh, you know you draw a diagram okay this is the uterus this is the tube and the pregnancy is inside the tube if you want to explain about ectopic pregnancy so that visual aid is easier for the patient to understand uh after communication with patient so communication of patient will involve a lot of things and it in, includes uh so not only it's the words that you speak uh it's there is something called as a non verbal communication which will be definitely assessed by uh, the clinical examiner and also please remember the lay examiner you know that in part 3 exam in four of the sessions you do in four out of the 14 sessions you do there is a lay examiner sitting along with the clinical examiner now these lay examiners are also trained examiners but they are not doctors but from the journal public but they you will assess you on the same domains as the clinical examiner will so these stations in which you have both the clinical examiner and the lay examiner there will be carrying the carrying more marks maximum marks so so how you communicate with the patient verbally and non verbally also will determine your assessment in the exam so what i mean by a non verbal communication is your body language the manner in which you are speaking whether you are calm and confident you know anybody us included when we go to a doctor we want to talk to a calm and confident doctor rather than a panicky or nervous doctor so that also is the same thing in the exam though you are panicking inside though you are stressed because of the exam scenario you still have to appear inside you may be uh, palpitating but outside you need to appear to be calm and confident as a doctor should be and as a doctor you would want to see the other important thing in communication is not speaking but listening 100 times i say during the course whenever i take the introduction session listen to the role player listening to the role player is in capital it is in big caps unless you listen to the role player you won't be directed in many stations to the actual direction in the which the station is going now some stations are very straight forward you know okay this and you know the management plan but some stations will not be straight forward in this in those stations you require
the help of the role player to actually guide you through the station. And unless you have the ear to listen to the role player, you won't be able to actually navigate that station. So important is to listen to the role player. So that, and, and it has to be an active listening. When you listen to something, you have to react to it. When the patient says, I'm very sad, you have to react to it. So it has to be an active listening. It's not that patient says sad, you said, okay, How's your, uh, uh, how's your urinary, any urinary problem you have, anything? No. It says I'm sad, it says I'm sorry to see that you're sad. So it has to be an active listening. It's not just you're listening, but not reacting. The other thing important is empathy. Patient having an IUD, patient having cancer, uh, patient angry because some complication has happened, you have to have that empathy for the patient and you have to show it from your body language and through what the words you speak. Acknowledging the patient's emotions is important. So this all things come under the non-verbal communication. So, you know, patient is crying and you offer her a tissue or a glass of water. You don't have to speak anything, but the, 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 you are communicating through your actions. So, so, so it is very important for you to all, all of you to understand that this non-verbal communication is as important as verbal communication. So this is about communication with patient and relative. The next is communication with colleagues. Uh, now this domain communication with colleagues is generally tested in the structured discussion station. Uh, so most of the structured, so all of the structured discussions. So you we'll have around four structured discussions in the exam out of 14. This is a direct viva with the examiner. Uh, there was some talk, uh, even in some of the courses, uh, which were there before the last exam, that uh, they may increase the number of structured discussions in the exam, though it's not finalized, not come in the website, but uh, if it happens, then, then we will, I mean, anyways, inform and we'll be knowing. But uh, at present, we have four stations with structured discussion. So communication with colleagues in these stations will mean communicating with your senior. So here, if you're talking to the examiner, you are talking to a senior colleague. So now this communication, you have to be respectful, definitely. You have to, again, sound confident, okay? So you're, you, somebody, your senior consultant comes and asks you about a treatment plan. So you have to be confident about a treatment plan, okay? You should be able to describe the diagnosis you have made and your management plan in scientific terms. Now here, don't talk about patient-friendly language. Here, it's a scientific manner because you're talking to another medical person. Other important thing is in communication with colleagues is when we talk about the multidisciplinary team. So the multidisciplinary team is a liaison between the various specialties or, you know, liaison between doctor and nurses or uh, allied specialists like, you know, the psychologist or the counselor. All this communication comes under communication with colleagues. Uh, then specialists and then midwives all form a part of the team. So whenever you are talking about uh, the multidisciplinary team in any particular scenario or station, you should remember when you talk that we will form or the multidisciplinary team is going to look after you, you should spell out the components of the multidisciplinary team. For example, uh, if it's a case of urogynecology in which the patient has stress incontinence, you say that a multidisciplinary team of, so who are the components? The gynecologist, the urologist, and the physiotherapist, the midwife, talk about the names of the members of the team. When you talk about a multidisciplinary team uh, in a station on uh, mental health, you uh, talk about uh, the obstetrician, the, the perinatal mental health specialist, the mental health midwife, you talk about the GP, the health visitor, the community uh, midwife for mental health, and also 
you should know the components and you should spell out the components or the people involved in the multidisciplinary team. Then another type of communication with colleagues is when you have a teaching station. So when you have a teaching station, you talk to your junior colleague and you are going to teach a particular thing, you know, maybe a type of instrumental delivery or you talk about shoulder dystocia or suturing or not tying to your junior colleague. Now, this is the opposite communication. When you talk to a junior colleague, you should be able to establish rapport with the junior colleague. You should be able to encourage them. You should encourage them to ask questions. You should give a positive feedback and you should take feedback from them for the session you have conducted. So all this come and you should not be uh, uh, you know, forbearing on your junior colleague. So all this comes under communication with colleagues. Okay, our next domain which we talk about is the applied clinical knowledge. Now the applied clinical knowledge, uh, okay, and just uh, to talk about uh, uh, okay, sorry, it's it's fine. So applied clinical knowledge is self-explanatory. So it's basically what you did in part two, you are applying in part three. So you read so many guidelines. Uh, you have the green top guidelines, you have the nice guidelines, you have the S R S H guidelines, you have the bash guidelines. Uh, you have the scientific impact papers. Uh, then you have the talk articles. You have the strategy. So all the knowledge you have gained, you have to apply in the stations. That is applied clinical knowledge. So the applied clinical knowledge also involves, actually, if you see, the domains are interconnected. So when I talk about the information gathering domain, now. If I, I, I think of what question to ask in a particular station, uh, then I should have that knowledge to know what is important in that station. So unless I know about a particular, uh, suppose I, unless I know about menorrhagia and what I want to rule out, I cannot ask questions. So applied clinical knowledge actually also is involved in information gathering, isn't it? Then other things is, Applied clinical knowledge majorly will involve when you have taken the history, examination, investigation, uh, all these things, you form a diagnosis and then explain the management plan to the patient. Okay. So important to understand this is that you should know about various options available for a particular condition. Like if we, same thing, if I talk about menorrhagia, you should know about conservative management, medical management, and surgical management. You have to explain all the types of management to the patient and help the patient to make an informed choice. So you should not direct the patient or you should not tell the patient that this is the management. You tell the patient the various management options, pros and cons of each, and allow them to make a decision on themselves, unless some particular management is contraindicated or affects the patient's safety, then you can say so. And also uh, applied clinical knowledge involves like, if the station might be patient prepared for a hysterectomy, uh, whether laparoscopy or vaginal hysterectomy, you should know about the procedure. You should know about the complications uh, of the surgery and should be able to explain the patient the risk and complications again to for them to understand and to take a decision okay the next domain last but not the least is patient safety now this is something uh, which is confusing and initially nobody understands what do they mean by patient safety so patient safety is everything that actually we do on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that patient is safe. Like suppose uh, there's a patient uh, who has high blood pressure in pregnancy or preeclampsia in pregnancy. 
you understand that that is a high risk pregnancy and you explain to the patient that it's a high risk pregnancy will involve more frequent and closer monitoring that's a patient safety point is it it to the other things like there are certain drugs which are to be avoided in pregnancy or when the patient is lactating again that's a patient safety point then asking the patient about alcohol smoking and recreational drugs and if any of this history is positive explain to the patient how it can affect their health taking history of allergy so never ever forget history of allergy in any case though sometimes it may seem to us as very repetitive but you need to understand that this is something we need to ask because in some particular case it may be positive and may have a bearing on the management assessing thromboprophylactic risks in pregnancies and starting thromboprophylaxis when you are examining the patient you say that i will examine you i would like to examine you in presence of a chaperone whether it's a male or a female doctor doesn't matter it's very important to have a chaperone this is ensuring patient dignity which also forms a part of patient safety when you are seeing an obstetric case ask about blood group okay because if it's an rh negative the management will be different so that also comes under patient safety <clears throat> talking about antibiotics before a procedure when they are indicated now in you should all again remember in this exam you are st5 you are a registrar so even though many of you are working in higher ranks are consultants in your own places but for exam purposes you are registrar level so anything which cannot be done at the st5 level in the uk you may need to call the consultant so some complication has occurred in the surgery or it's a complicated surgery or it's a situation in which you need to involve a senior call the consultant that also is a part of patient safety but remember you should avoid saying in each situation that i am going to call the consultant because you have to be confident at your level but you should not be over confident so you should have the optimal level of confidence that is patient safety then the other things are uh, in patient safety are the hidden agendas so talking about domestic abuse or sexual abuse and uh, uh bullying in a teaching station these may be the hidden agendas uh risk management is a very important part of patient safety wherever possible and wherever it's indicated talk about risk management uh child safety child safeguarding also is all patient safety so these are the things uh we talk about when we talk about patient safety so it's an important domain it's not difficult to under if you understand what it is about you should be able uh to actually uh implement this patient safety in most of your stations so mostly you have to understand what patient safety is so this was our last domain uh what i would suggest is to understand more on these domains uh you should read <laughs> the lisa joel's book okay so if you read the lisa joel's book the the all the domains and in each module how the domains are uh actually implemented is given very nicely they are given in the form of tables if you read uh it comprehensively you will understand the domains and it will be e uh, it will be easy for you to apply this in your station so uh, i think that's a homework for you so one thing as i said earlier you should start reading the patient information leaflets and the other thing is the first book i would read is the lisa joel's book it gives you the basics of the exam explains very well the domains of the modules and there are uh, 14 stations in the book about each module also they have got four videos so if you read it thoroughly and understand uh, what they are trying to say it's a very good initial preparation for the exam so those of you who are actually uh, just starting preparation should definitely read uh, this book okay let's move forward
so uh, the important things which uh, uh, i want to discuss today is uh, about children and young adults just give me a second okay so this uh, uh, basically uh, these were the few topics we chose for these uh, webinars is why it's important is because uh, dealing with an adult and dealing with children and young adults is slightly different there are certain points in the patient safety which you need to remember uh, for children and young adults and you should apply it in each station so what are important points in these kind of scenarios one is the sensitivity so you will require a greater deal of sensitivity in asking questions uh, when you asking questions from a child or a younger adult because unless you are sensitive about it you cannot develop rapport and you will not be able to get the in required information one they will not give you proper history and thereby you won't be able to properly manage this patient the other thing to be thought about is the capacity whether the child or the young adult has the capacity to take decisions on the treatment so for that the concept of mental capacity is important another very important thing in young adults which you should remember is confidentiality you should be able to assure that you would keep the conversation confidential again this this will this this is the once you assure them on the confidentiality this will give them the confidence to actually bring out the history and then tell you what the problem is about and then you will be able to do that station the opposite effect of, uh, the opposite opposite to the confidentiality is the safeguarding so there is, there are certain cases there will be certain situations in the stations where you cannot maintain confidentiality when you suspect that the child's life is at risk or child is being ill treated and you need to involve the higher authorities in those cases the safeguarding principle comes into force and the confidentiality may have to be broken so these are the the broad things which you should remember in any of these stations the other concepts in dealing with young adults are the kinetic competence it took me some time when when i was reading about it it took me some time to understand these concepts and i'm sure it will take time for you to understand as well for these you need to read about it and then think what they're trying to say so the topics so the i'll talk in brief about kinetic competence fraser guidelines as i said confidentiality is another thing safeguarding sexual abuse is a important thing needs to be ruled out in each station especially again the in these stations the role player may give you cues if you think the the, the young patient a young adult is not forthcoming uh, not very forward with the answers uh, these are things you should think about hidden agendas also screening and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases especially in young adults is important part of uh, the uk management so you should know and you should always think about vulnerable populations uh socially vulnerable populations which may require in addition to what management you plan for them uh, they may require some social support okay so let's talk about the gilic competence and the fraser guidelines because this is more commonly these kind of stations uh you will find in exams related to this topic 
So the Gillick competence means that it is it's, it's used in medical law. This term is used in medical law to decide whether the child under uh, 16 years is able to consent to his or her mental medical treatment. So it depends on their emotional and intellectual maturity and their ability to understand treatment. So there is no lower age limit for Gillick competence. It means whether the child has a capacity to take a decision of, about the treatment. The Fraser guidelines are basically, they were initially uh, given for contraceptive advice and treatment provided to a child under 16 without parental consent or knowledge. Now it is extended to abortion and sexually transmitted infection and the termination of pregnancy also. The prerequisites for applying Fraser guidelines are that the girl will understand the advice, that the professional cannot persuade her to inform her parents or allow them to inform the parents that she is seeking contraceptive advice. So, so even if the, the child or the young adult comes to you and says that, uh, I don't want to inform my mother or father or my parents, you still should try to pursue it from your side. You, could, you should say that, okay, I know that you are, uh, you don't want to inform your mother, but I will still suggest that uh, if you want, I can explain to her uh, about your condition and then she might be able to help and support you in some manner. If she says no, you cannot force her, but you still should try to persuade her. That she's likely to begin or continue having sexual intercourse with or without contraceptive treatment. That unless she receives the contraceptive advice or treatment, her physical or mental health, or both are likely to suffer. That her best interests require him to give her contraceptive advice, treatment, or both without parental consent. The next thing is the ages. Now, under 13, there is no lower age limit given for Gilly competence of Fraser, but those under 13, that means 12 and below, are not legally able to consent to any sexual active, even if they are gilly competent, doesn't matter, under 13 cannot consent to any sexual activity. 16 to 17 year old are the gray zone. So 18 is adult, 16 to 17 is a gray zone. The 16 to 17 year olds have the capacity to consent to medical treatment. The only difference 16 to 17 have from over 18 are then if they refuse treatment and you think that this refusal of treatment can lead to death, severe permanent injury or mental or physical harm, then in the best interest of the child, the refusal of treatment can be overridden. Under 16, uh, not really competent, some, those who don't have the capacity, they, someone with parental responsibility can consent for them. It may be child's mother or father or the child's legally appointed guardian, a person who, with a resident order concerning the child, a local authority designated to, to care for the child, a local authority or person with an emergency protection order of, for the child. Now, this is too much in detail. I will not go into detail. I know sometimes you will find it difficult to understand. I would suggest that read the TOG article on mental capacity to understand it further. Now, what is safeguarding? I just wanted to explain safeguarding before we go on to the stations. Now, if the young person under the age of 16 presents to a healthcare professional then, and, uh, and then discloses a history raising safeguarding concern, if they are deemed not deemed to be really competent, the health professional is obliged to raise the issue as a safeguarding concern and escalate their concerns through the safeguarding process. If they are de deemed to be really competent and the disclosure is considered essential to protect them from harm or to be in the public interest, the health professional should escalate concerns through the safeguarding process. In both cases, in both cases, please remember this, this is an important line. The health professional should inform the young person of this action unless doing so could 
pose significant additional risk to the state's care, and it's reasonable for the local authority or the police to decide whether it's appropriate to inform the parents of the concerns raised. Now, this in simple language means that if you find any young adult or child, there is some safeguarding issue. It's your duty to now inform to the safeguarding process. Go through the safeguarding process, whether it's a local authority, safeguarding authority, or police. In the meantime, as far as your con conversation with the patient is concerned, though you said earlier that I would maintain confidentiality, in this scenario, you tell the the for the child or the young adult that I know. Uh, I know this conversation is con confidential. Yeah, yeah, I'm explaining the same same thing. I mean to say that if you are you are talking to a girl who wants contraceptive advice, and you feel so when you take the history, you ask about who is she sexually active with, the age of the boyfriend, and so on. Suppose you suspect there is any foul play that somebody is abusing that girl, or she has a history of a sexual assault. In those cases, you and or you feel that there is a threat to the life. All these cases, when you think she requires safeguarding, you cannot maintain that confidentiality. So if you begin, so in beginning of the conversation, if I'm talking to a young patient, I say that okay, whatever. is happening whatever conversation is happening between you and me it is confidential i'm not going to inform anybody unless you agree i'm not going to inform your parents but in the mean in the meantime when you you take more history you, you realize that there is some foul play involved or there is a threat or you are suspicious of a threat uh, to the mental or the physical health of the young individual you cannot maintain that confidentiality so you it's your duty to then inform the safeguarding team or the local authority or the police that this person is at risk but it's your duty to tell to that person that i am going to break confidentiality and inform the authorities about this because i am worried about your safety so why you are doing it is because of the safety for, for her safety for ensuring her safety and then you inform the safeguarding team but you inform her also so what they say is unless you feel that if you inform her it is going to cause further risk to her you should inform the patient and then break the confidentiality but that doesn't happen if it's an adult if the adult comes to you and you suspect foul play or it's a domestic abuse and you say that i do you offer to inform the police or the local authority if the person refuses to lodge a complaint or to inform the police you cannot force them but in case of a younger adult you it's your duty to inform the safeguarding team in case of an adult you can just offer them to inform the safeguarding team or the local authority or the police but you cannot force them to file a police complaint but in case of a younger adult it's your duty to go through the safeguarding process so that is that is what i want to say so an important i'm just i cannot talk too much about mental capacity in this uh, webinar but how do you assess capacity is you sh what are the components of that which you should understand that the person or the patient understands the information about the decision whatever information you have given about so suppose i'm talking about contraception she understands the the benefits of that particular contraceptive method the risk or uh, uh, understands the pros and cons of each con uh, contraceptive method remembers that information or retains that information can use that information to make a decision and communicate the decision by talking using sign language or other means that means that if i have, if a young patient comes to me and i tell her uh, she says i want a contraceptive method you give her a choice of lark you tell her about the implant uh, the iucd the mirena and the pill and then she says and she says and then you ask her which method would you like to go for she says i don't like needles and uh, i am not able to take uh, the pill because i will forget regularly but i can have the needle inserted that means she understand that why she cannot what is the advantage of 
a Mirena that she doesn't have to take a pill every day. And the implant has a needle. So she understands and then has used the information to make a decision for herself. And she has told you her decision. So that means that person has capacity. So this is how you will assess for capacity. It's only by a conversation with the patient. There is no specific uh, performer or a questionnaire for you to ask. But the important thing is that what information you have given, that person has understood the information, has retained the information, and used the information to make a decision, and then told you the decision of uh, about what treatment it works to take. OK. Uh, so we will start with the session now. We have two sessions here. So who wants to go and do the session now? Uh, can you write your names on the chat? Uh, I need someone to uh, who wants to volunteer to present the station? Uh, please, uh, okay, that is Nasma Salim. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. You can unmute yourself, Nasma. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourself to your friends here? Yes, I am uh, Dr. Nasma Salim. Uh, from where? Are you calling from where, Nasma? Yes. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. And uh, you're giving the exam for the first time? Yes. Okay. Good. So how's your preparation going? Yes, sir. I'm trying. Good. I know. It's... So what difficulty do you face in the part three preparation? Um, mainly regarding... Um... Uh, some uh, stations in the um, structure discussion. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that's mainly. Yeah, so I, I agree with you that uh, structure discussions, uh, many of us will have difficulty in structure discussion. When we understand the communication, it is easier to do the uh, simulated patient task, but uh, structure discussions are difficult because again, the, the answer is in the term, the structure discussion that you have to structure your answers and you don't know what the next question is going to be. But again, mm -hmm. uh, how you can overcome is that by frequent practice doing as many structure discussions as possible. Uh, for the structure discussion, I will uh, advise that all of you should read the Tony Hollingworth book, which has got a lot of structure discussions, which are not there much in the other book. So I think uh, you can practice such a discussion from Tony Hollingworth along with the normal usual book. OK, mm -hmm. so okay. We, we can start the session. Do you want to uh, come on video? Is it OK? Or you want to speak from behind? Uh, uh, it's OK. No problem. Yeah, because I, may, I would be able to see your expressions then. OK. OK? Okay, so first you can just read the station, then I will uh, stop the screen sharing and then uh, we can do the video. So we can do that, uh, Omama.
Okay. Okay, your two minutes start now. Okay. Okay. So, where are you, Nasma? Okay. 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 Just Hello? a minute. I yeah. I just okay. uh, let me start the timer for you. Just give me one second. Okay. The ten minutes start now. Hello, I am Dr. Nasma, one of the doctors today in the clinic. Uh, are you Master? Uh, hi, Doctor. I am Martha. Hi, Martha. How are you doing? I'm okay, Doctor. I understand you are here requesting the emergency contraception. Am I right? Oh, uh, yeah, Doctor. I'm I'm very scared that I might get pregnant because you know I went to a party and then uh, I had sex night night. We didn't use any protection. Uh -huh. No need to worry. I am here to help you. Uh, so, do you have any other concern to regarding today's visit? Uh, no, that's it, doctor. Okay. So uh, today I will be discussing with you, and I will uh, tell you about the, uh, your options regarding the emergency contraception, uh, and um, you can decide. Um, so, but first, uh, it's my first time to meet you. Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, can you tell me more about uh, this uh, party? You said you have uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, yeah, doctor. I went to my friend's house yesterday, and you know, uh, uh, I had this party, and then I met my uh, friend's friend, and then you know, things happened, and then. Uh, it just happened, mm -hmm. it was around last night, around say mm -hmm. 10 o'clock. And uh, then, you know, I thought that, oh, I did not use any protection. So uh, I'm, I'm very scared, doctor. So I need something, you know, please give me something. Okay, uh, no problem. So uh, it was uh, someone not your regular uh, uh, boyfriend? So you don't know? No, doctor, no, I don't have a boyfriend. Uh, so this was your first uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse uh, during uh, this uh, month? Uh, yes, doctor, I think so, yeah. This was the first time this month. Okay. Uh, 
so um, so, so uh, do you what do you use for contraception martha uh, just condoms doctor Hello, Nasma. Yes. And so, what do you use for contraception, Martha? Uh, I use condoms sometimes, but sometimes I forget, doctor. I don't remember. Okay. So, uh, can you tell me um, when was your last menstrual period? Uh, around, uh, I think, nine, ten days back. Okay. And are your periods regular? Uh, yeah, they're very regular. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, can you tell me, uh, do you have uh, any uh, um, medical problem? Mm, no, doctor. Okay. Uh, did you do any surgeries before? No. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I might ask you some uh, personal questions. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, do you smoke? No, no doctor. Okay. Any alcohol? Uh, I had once or twice before. Uh -huh. Any recreational drugs? No. Okay, and uh, um, can you tell me how are things at your school? Pardon? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How are things at your school? Is everything all right at school? Uh, you go, you go yeah. to school? Yeah, I go to school. I am in the uh, 10th grade. Yeah, everything looks okay. Yeah, everything is fine at school. Okay, so um, okay, so do, do you have any history of uh, a discharge from down below or any foul smell? Mm, no, not right now. Any pain in your tummy? No. Okay, and um, uh, where who do you live with? Uh, I live with my parents. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, is everything okay at home? Yeah, doctor, everything okay. Okay, and uh, any disease running in the family? Mm, not that I know of, doctor. Okay, so um, do you have any allergy? No. Uh -huh. And are you taking any medication? No, uh, yeah, but the regular cough, cough and cold, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anything you would like to add? Uh, no, doctor. Uh, I hope you can give me something for this. Okay. So, um, are you aware of your weight? And uh, I think it's normal because last time I went to the GP, he checked. He said it was okay. Um, okay, good. So, thank you for sharing this information uh, with me uh, regarding your request for emergency contraception. I may have to uh, uh, examine you uh, and um, uh, see your blood pressure and uh, pulse and um, um, uh, take swabs um, from down below uh, to to rule out if there is uh, any infection. Uh, am I clear? Is it okay? Uh, is that swab necessary, doctor? Uh, 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 sorry? What, what uh, test are you going to take? I couldn't hear. Uh, do, sorry, doctor. What okay, test are you going, going to do? 
Okay, I'm going to uh, 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 put uh, some uh, small device from down below to see uh, your naked zone, and I will uh, take uh, some swab from your um, uh, um, anterior passage and your neck of the womb uh, to uh, see if there is uh, any infection. Uh, am I clear? Okay, if it's necessary, yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yes, Master, because uh, your, uh, your age is considered the high risk for uh, uh, sexually shared infection. That's why um, I advise you to uh, use condom uh, during the intercourse to avoid uh, getting any infection. Okay. Any question so far? No, doctor. Okay. What about the so emergency contraception, doctor? Emergency contraception. You. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, your option has uh, uh, either uh, tablet or uh, coil. Uh, the coil can be uh, inserted from uh, down below and uh, you can uh, remove uh, after your next period if you would like. You can keep it as a method of contraception if you would like it uh, for a long uh, uh, period uh, of time. Oh, but um, the coil sounds very scary, uh, doctor. Is, a... uh, is oh, there any tablet which uh, I can it's take? So scary. Look at Yes, yes, there are other tablets, um, something called uh, uh, L1 uh, and another called uh, Livonel. These are tablets that can be taken uh, if you uh, uh, don't like uh, the coil. Mm, um, oh, I will prefer the tablet, I, doctor. Okay, so uh, you, uh, you told me that uh, your recycles are regular, they come every uh, can you uh, know every uh, how many days? Uh, every thirty days uh, on date. Okay, and you said your last period was on uh, about ten days ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, around ten okay. days. So, so you probably uh, did not release an. Okay, egg. time's up. Um, now. Yes, ma. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll do that. Continue. Just continue. Okay. okay, so uh, if you would like, you can uh, just take the tablet. Uh, you probably did not release an egg before, uh, right now, so it will be safe for you to take uh, the tablet. Um, uh, the, the tablet may um, delay your period a little, but if you, your period, uh, uh, you don't have your period, you have to do a, a pregnancy test. Um, to uh, exclude the uh, pregnancy. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Mm, no, doctor. Okay. So it's over. Okay. So how was it, Nasma? It's not so good because uh, I wasn't prepared and uh, I'm already outside, but I said uh, I should volunteer as long as no one is volunteering. <laughs> No, it's, it's okay. It's a, I think it's a big thing uh, to actually uh, present in form of in, in front of so many unknown people. So I applaud your uh, courage in uh, volunteering for it. So that's a good thing. And I think uh, you history wise, you covered most of the points actually. So only again, I in the beginning, when I talked about the domains, I told you information gathering has to take four minutes and you took mm -hmm. almost six to seven minutes for that. And that's why your station doesn't get over. So it's the same thing. So if it's too much of time, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you take too much of time for history, you cannot discuss the management. That, that's what happens. You know, you, if you, even if you know the things, you want to say more, there's no time left. And here I can give you time, but once the bell rings in the exam, you just have to rush. You go to the next, uh, because you, there is no time, the other person will come there. So, yes, I know you are in the big, you have started preparation, you have to keep practicing because what, what you are doing is what I told you. You know, you think about your next question. So when you start thinking, 
it takes time you know you think oh now i have to ask about medical history now i will ask about surgical history okay now i have to ask about smoking alcohol recreational drugs all that so it is taking time so the important thing is that you everything if you if you remember uh, if you practice again and again okay these are the points in the history mind you if you keep speaking it again and again and you time yourself so uh, what i used to do is i used to time that okay this this is the history taking template okay the presenting complaints any any session you can take presenting complaints then medical surgical allergies all this history obstetric tiny history and then you keep speaking it and you time yourself and you see oh i am taking 6 minutes to do it you have to do it again do it again and again till you reach 4 minutes 4 minutes is optimal even if you take 4 minutes the role player is going to speak for another 1 or 2 minutes and 6 minutes are gone so so i know it's difficult and you did a i think it was a good attempt but you should now keep practicing it so that takes shorter time uh, as far as the questions are concerned uh, i think you ask most of the things you asked about uh, so in this case you will ask okay you have to ask first about the sexual intercourse unprotected sexual intercourse that happened where did it happen with whom did it happen uh, you should always ask about whether any drugs or alcohol was taken at that i know you asked later do you take alcohol but uh, in a young person taking alcohol and it is under the influence when she doesn't remember or things like that there is a possibility they can be sexual assault it is without consent so ask about whether she took any alcohol or drugs in this party at that point of time you ask about it was a known person or a unknown person that that's good and uh, then I, i think it's a good idea to uh, ask about whether it was with her consent because if she says it is unknown person and all you should it's a good idea to ask that uh, uh, i am sorry to ask you this it's a very sensitive question but uh, i am worried about your safety so you can sign post like that that uh, you know i know it's sensitive and you may find it embarrassing or it it may might seem very uh, sensitive but then uh, i need to uh, uh, you know ask it because i am worried or i'm concerned about your safety and then you can ask this question so this is one thing uh, important thing uh, which you forgot was the confidentiality when you ask you say that i am this and uh, I, in between you should assure once you know that uh, i know the patient was quite confident but the patient will be like you know don't tell my mother don't tell my parents and you say that uh, whatever is conversation is happening here uh, we'll stay here and uh, i'm not going to inform anybody without your consent is one thing uh, then uh, you did ask about the bmi which is very good you uh, the questions i think you asked about this uh, you asked about the uh, any previous sexually transmitted infections i'm just i'm just reading from the points you said that's fine and in the management part uh, and the social history also you asked so how are things at school that's important who she is living with whether she belongs to a vulnerable population or everything okay at home is that's also important uh then you uh can you just mute your mic dear nesma can you whose whose mic is on next yeah uh please all of you mute your mic okay uh so age of the partner is something we also should be if she knows the age of the partner uh it's another thing we want to rule out okay so uh this is all uh, i'm just reading through the important things which she did in her nesma was she said uh use of uh, so screening for sti so when you say that i would like to examine you uh you should not say that i would take a swab instead you said that i can offer you a screening screening for a sexually transmitted infection which is recommended for all girls at your age okay to rule out any sexual transmitted infections because in this age any infection can be harmful uh, has a long term effect on uh, you know long term harmful effect so if you are okay so you offer that screening you should not uh say that i am i'm going to take the swab you say that i would like to offer you screening for sexual transmitted infection which is recommended for all girls at your age so this is something you can do you talked about uh, condom safe sex practice actually this should come at the end first you should talk about uh, the emergency contraception that is what she has come with so you first talked about sti screen that you can say because you are uh, going to examine her you say that 
sci screen you can offer but talking about safe sex practice and all should come later because first problem is our emergency contraception and in the end you find that you know time is over you're not able to explain her everything uh, then you say that when you talk about the coil you said the first uh, i would talk about the coil which is the most effective uh, method of contraception and you should say that the advantage of giving you the coil is that it can be used as an ongoing method of contraception so that is the main advantage of the copperty or the coil is that one is that it's the most effective it's more effective than a medication uh, and then second thing is that it 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 is uh, it can be used as a uh, long acting method of contraception because we said that you can remove it in the next cycle so instead of this in a young girl you should offer her it as a long acting method of contraception that, rather than saying that uh you you can remove it okay because so that is the advantage and then you talk about the drugs which and then she says i can't i don't want to use the coil then okay we talked about the drugs uh yes we could not finish it uh then you uh uh i'll just so now this this uh, person uh, looks very confident doesn't look scared or uh, or anything but yes because i didn't want to make it complicated but if you have a role player who is not very confident or who is scared then always rule out sexual abuse uh things like grooming uh any mental health issues maybe there is a coexisting mental and uh, health issues like depression so all these things uh, you should ask so and yes you asked about the previous episode in the cycle the last menstrual period and that point of time only you should ask about the cycle regularity because that came later what i mean is that 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 all shows that we need to be more structured in the history taking because if you go half as you ask lmp first and then you go about later on you come back to cycle regularity uh, you are just wasting time and we don't have time so time is uh, time management is very important so when you ask about the last menstrual period you ask about whether your cycles are regular and stuff okay Uh, and then you talked about uh, pregnancy tests and you should say that 3 weeks from the uh, unprotected intercourse she should be doing a pregnancy test uh, to even if when she is taking con uh, emergency contraception uh, so okay well done uh, i think if you practice history uh, and i think you need to uh, that's why you you have the knowledge uh, but you need to sound more confident so in between i felt i am i'm sure in, you know in this big gathering when you are speaking in front of 30 people that is expected but you should sound if you know the things if you sound more confident uh, that will obviously uh, fetch you more marks in the exam uh, so let us go back uh, to our powerpoint when i will just talk more about this so as you as you see this station has a lay examiner so this kind of station definitely they will be having some lay examiner and this station will be worth more marks so duty of confidentiality talk about consent so you say that uh, i am sorry to ask you this question which sounds very intrusive but uh, uh somebody has i can't see the chat properly who's uh, volunteering hello can i ma'am okay ah okay jyoti jyoti oh, who is that i am surbhi okay so i think jyoti has written first oh, there are okay. lot of people okay ah yeah hi surbhi can okay. i ah wait 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 i just was not able to read let me just speak and then you can come okay uh so age of the partner is important uh, somebody asked about the age of the partner the age of the partner is important because if the age difference is more than 5 years then you have concerns about grooming and safeguarding so if it's a similar age patient a person having intercourse it's it's fine but if the age gap is more than 5 years then it is a problem uh important to ask whether alcohol or any recreational drugs was involved uh, during this unprotected intercourse establish the education of the person the social factors cycle last menstrual period because uh, once the ovulation has occurred then we don't talk about uh, or uh, tablets okay because they won't be effective because they basically delay the ovulation so you should know the mechanism of action so when we are talking about uh, the the medical methods of emergency contraception 
they are basically uh, delaying the ovulation. So if the ovulation has already occurred, they won't be effective. So which method you have to decide based on this, okay? And then offer long-term contraception, STI screening, and safe sex practices like condoms. So any, remember, now any young adult coming for a problem like this, STI screening, safe sex practice like condom, and long and acting contraception, you should offer. Any person uh, coming for TOP also, STI screening, it's an opportunistic screening, long-term contraception, especially less than 25 years, and safe sex practices you should be offering. Okay, let me just go through uh, these tables, which are very interesting. Uh, many of you must be knowing if you have attended our previous classes. This is uh, from the strategy. Okay, this is from the strategy. Uh, strategy, I think it's very good for this module of uh, sexual and reproductive health module. Okay, uh, so if you can see, this can give you a good uh, counseling material uh, for the patient. So you say that copper IUD can be used up till 120 hours from the unprotected sexual intercourse. Uh, it is toxic to the sperm and the oocyte and may prevent implantation. Efficacy is high, is the most effective method, one in thousand uh, pregnancy rate after use. LR1, or ulipristal acetate, 30 milligram acts by delaying ovulation. So it doesn't work once ovulation has already occurred. Again, 120 hours uh, after unprotected intercourse. The failure rate is 1 to 2 percent. Levonorgestrel 1.5 uh, mg delays ovulation within 72 hours from un uh, the unprotected sexual intercourse. Failure rate is higher than uh, LR1, 2 to 3 percent. So almost double the failure rate. Uh, this pro forma for the emergency contraception is very nice. Uh, again, this is from the strategy. If you can remember this pro forma, uh, you can do all stations on emergency contraception. So I have taken this uh, station on emergency contraception uh, for young adults, but otherwise uh, emergency contraception is a very commonly asked station in the exam. So you should be knowing uh, emergency contraception thoroughly. Now some students ask me that, uh, you know, there's so many guidelines to study and then for part three, which guidelines we should study. Uh, out of the FRSH guidelines, the, fac the, uh, the Faculty of Sexual Reproductive Health uh, guidelines, I think the most important guideline which you should study for part three is the emergency contraception. You may not study in detail the other guidelines, but EC is one thing you should be doing. Okay, so if you see, if I read this performa, is the whole history you need to take for emergency contraception. So age in years, LMP, whether this was a normal LMP, cycle is regular or not, pregnancy test was done or not, what is her usual method of contraception with Nesma asked. I think Nesma asked a very good history, only thing is her history took long time. So, so that's what I'm saying, the knowledge is one thing, knowledge plus communication and how you're communicating is this exam. So usual method of contraception the patient is using, unprotected sex or a failure of any uh, contraceptive method. When was the first episode of unprotected sex since the patient's last period or since hormonal failure? The date. Whether this is the first or there is another intercourse earlier, so you have to emphasize that the emergency contraception given now will not protect against the previous unprotected intercourse and even the unprotected intercourse taking place later in the cycle. And then when you're talking about property, you can say that it will protect against the further acts of unprotected intercourse, where the tablets would not, okay? So hours since, day in the cycle, any EC already taken in the cycle, was the sex consensual? That's important. Vomiting with EC, so if she has taken, so when you're talking about medication, you say that have you taken uh, emergency contraception tablet earlier if if she has any had any problem? Like if she has vomited with the tablet earlier, then you need to give her a domsal or a domperidone uh, around 20 minutes prior to taking the tablet. So 10 milligram, 20 minutes prior to the tablet. Okay. 
so if yes vomiting with the ec previously then consider domperidone 10 mg orally 20 minutes before the pills or copper iucd uh if because if it's a sexual assault case then refer to guideline okay so if it all episodes are within 120 hours or before day 19 consider iucd now the medical history you need to take is porphyria because la1 cannot be given in porphyria omeprazole will reduce the effect of la1 and should avoid la1 with porphyria you cannot give any medical method only copper iod if there is a severe asthma which has a poor control giving steroids then again avoid la1 because it can precipitate asthma liver enzyme including medication again you use copper iucd or use double dose of levonil that is a 3 mg dose which is an unlicensed use and uh, you cannot give la1 and you know the enzyme inducers are carbamazepine phenytoin primidone topiramate phenobarbital rifampicin zifabutin some hiv uh, anti hiv drugs and st john's wort and then what methods did you discuss oral and copper iucd talk about timing of pla- pa- uh, tablets action if any vomiting occurs so if there is any vomiting which occurs within 3 hours of taking the tablet she has to take a repeat tablet next and also explain her that the next period may be early or late and may have a light bleeding in next few days but that should not be considered as a period a return if there is any further unprotected intercourse discuss the failure rate pregnancy test in 3 to 4 weeks unless as a normal period if the livonoil fails it is not harmful to the pregnancy if the la1 fails the effects are unknown and you give the patient information leaflet that's important as well and if you see it's very nicely given if it's given between day 10 to 17 the risk of pregnancy is 20 to 30% if day 1 to 9 and 18 to 28 risk is lesser because it's outside the ovulation if you give livonoil within 72 hours 85% reduction in the pregnancy risk within 72 to 120 hours 64% reduction la1 85% reduction again copper iod gives more than 99% reduction in expected pregnancy okay and what ec was issued and what is the intended method or long term method of contraception which is given to the patient so this performer if you see it is a complete performa for emergency contraception if you can remember this con- uh, performa you can remember everything about uh, emergency contraception and yes and the further if you see sti risk discussed okay and you can say that uh, there is a okay, it's important to see these things now there is a 10 to 14 day period for window period for chlamydia gc and trichomonas swab and 3 month window period for syphilis hepatitis b c and hiv so you should tell them where to access sti test or treatment of appropriate so that's also important that if you take a swab now and especially it's an unknown person which she has intercourse if you take a swab when you are uh, seeing the patient it may be in the window period because she just had uh, sexual intercourse so you have to keep in mind the window period so if it's an unknown person or person she is not familiar with you should repeat a swab it has to be taken 10 to 14 days for the gcn chlamydia and the tv and 3 months for syphilis uh hepatitis b c and hiv and then see see this part and see the lower part if patient is aged between 13 to 16 years the young adults we were talking about there is a less than 16 performa completed or not okay explain confidentiality is there anyone with the patient is so who so this also okay with this we miss this nesma so you should ask us has somebody come with you have you informed somebody that you are here would you like uh, me to inform your uh, have you informed your parents or your guardian this is important who knows the patient is here how old is the partner whether the patient is attending school lives with family friends in care or homeless any concern regarding <coughs> sorry uh, assault or abuse any concerns regarding drugs or alcohol assess phrasal component yes not phrasal component so 12 year old or child protection issues it will be something else 
So you can see that's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, performa, which I think everybody uh, should take it from the strategy and read about it. Uh, because emergency contraception is something which is very, as I said, very, very uh, common. Uh, so yes, uh, if unknown, then you talk about uh, PEP and all. Uh, generally, uh, CC says is known to a friend's friend. So uh, it's it's a very gray area whether PEP you will be giving to everyone. Uh, definitely, if it's a sexual assault or something, you offer PEP. Uh, so it's not mentioned clearly whether you offer PEP to all. But yes, you do screening for the STI risk. Okay, so let's go on to the next uh, case. So, uh, so Jyoti, are you there? Yeah. Okay, just give me a uh, second. Uh, would you like to come on screen? Actually, I'm in the hospital. I cannot come on screen right now. Is that okay? Okay, no problem. Yeah, that's okay. Just give me two minutes. I just uh, will come back in a minute, okay? Okay. Okay, uh, Jyoti, so one second. Okay. Okay. Ten minutes. Oh, sorry. Two minutes. Your time starts now.
Okay, 10 minutes. Hello, I'm Dr. Jyoti, one of the doctors in the gynae clinic today. May I please confirm your name and age? Hi, doctor. I'm Diane. I'm 15 years old. Hello, Diane. Uh, how may I help you today? Uh, so, doctor, I have this uh, very embarrassing problem, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I read about it. It's uh, my... So, external part of my vagina i know it's a, called as a labia i think it's very large and you know uh, i think it's not normal i feel i require a surgery so i had gone to the gp and uh, he said that you're going to help me with that okay so uh, don't worry dan so i'll uh, we, uh, i'm there to, uh, we are there to help you today uh, but before uh, discussing it, uh, discussing your concern, I would like to ask you a few questions. Is that okay with you? Mm, okay. Okay. So, uh, since when have you noticed that it has become abnormal? Uh, it has become very large. Can you tell me in detail about it? Uh, so, doctor, so uh, I always, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been always checking my vagina and all. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I went to the internet and I checked online and I saw those pictures on the internet and, you know, my labia looks very abnormal, it's very large. And uh, I think I cannot have a normal life with this. So I, I was thinking a lot and then I read on the internet about a lot of views of what other girls and I think, uh, and they were very happy with this surgery. Okay, so have you discussed this concern with anybody else? Uh, I, I did try to uh, talk to my mother, but uh, she just said that uh, you're very young now. And uh, I, I don't think she understood what I was trying to say. So I didn't talk much about her, much to her. Okay, no problem. And uh, have you started getting your periods? Uh, yeah, my period started uh, around a year back. Uh, my periods are okay. Any problem in your, in your periods? Uh, initially, they were not very regular, but now now they are okay. Okay. So, uh, and any problem, uh, do you think that your uh, growth, like your breast growth and everything is like uh, like every other normal girl in your school? Or uh, is, yeah. it there, is there any problem? Uh, no, the problem is down there only, doctor. It's, it's okay. very abnormal. Like I, I, I'm just getting so much stress because of that. And how are your friends at school? Mm, they are okay. How is everything in the school? Your studies and everything? Uh, everything is fine, you know. But you know, because of this, uh, I, I, I am an athlete and I used to run. Uh, but uh, I feel very because of this, I, I just don't feel like running and swimming now because I think I will look very abnormal if I. Uh, where they are running close. So I've stopped that, doctor. Uh, Dean, you don't have... Uh, okay, I'll, uh, we'll discuss it about discuss about it, but you uh, let me tell you, you don't have to be uh, that very concerned uh, very concern about it. You don't look... Uh, uh, the um, uh, Okay, and uh, do you have boyfriend? Uh, not yet, Sorry, but... I just, uh, want to know whether... Are you sexually active? Uh, not yet, because I've... I've this is, as I told the doctor, you know, my, this is all abnormal. If I have a boyfriend, what will I do? I'm going to run away. Okay. Um, so, uh, Diane, uh, let me, uh, I'm really sorry that you are thinking about it like, uh, like this, that this is abnormal. But let me assure you, the pictures which we see on the net are, um, uh, it's not necessary that everyone has the same body type. Okay, it may it the, there may be slight variation. Like every individual is different. Like we all have different names. We all have different appearance. So the appearance of the our external body parts or genitals can be different. Uh, okay, so it's not necessary that the the certain pattern will be seen for is common for every individual. So you don't. But <laughs> Yeah. But I don't like this appearance, doctor. Just do a surgery for me. Uh, see, uh, Dian, uh, the surgery, uh, any surgery.
for the uh, cosmetic uh, yeah yeah uh, sorry we lost you yeah yeah hello sorry yeah hello yeah, yeah in between i lost you yeah start please yeah so uh, the surgery uh, the surgery can only be done for uh, if there is any grass a gross abnormality as a therapy the surgery for cosmetic enhancement is not recommended at this age since you are still in a growing age so what i would recommend you is that i, I would still like to refer you to uh, um a uh, counselor who can help you uh, cope up with these changes and probably you are having these changes because you are still in a growing age we call it puberty so the body our body changes from our childhood to adulthood so uh, i'll refer i would uh, uh, i would like to refer you to uh, refer you to a counselor who can uh, talk to you and help you cope up with these changes better and if not then and also a uh, examination uh, i would like to examine you uh, if i see any problem uh, uh, and I, i would also involve my colleague a consultant he will also uh, see if there is any uh, problem if any treatment is required then we can give you the treatment is that uh, am i am i clear and then what, what do you mean by uh, required treatment I, i require treatment i think it's abnormal and the gp told me that everything is normal and then i said no i want to see a gynecologist and then now you are saying everything is normal oh uh, see uh, dn this is normal for this I, age i am okay i am okay with surgery and i have no problem in undergoing surgery i know but the surgery at the for the cosmetic enhancement for for the genitals is is illegal we it is uh, it it is included under the genital mutilation which is not legal in uk so i'm really sorry that uh, but if any treatment if I, if there is any gross abnormality if there is any functional or structural problem i will also inform my consultant he will also uh, does examine you and see your uh, details if it is required then only it can be done and um, if uh, um, and otherwise uh, for, i would first of all i would like to meet you to a counselor who can help you uh, to cope up with these changes since in most of the girls that this is this is a normal change which occurs because of the uh, this uh, growing age uh, am i clear oh i'm not uh, i don't know doctor but okay if you fix an appointment with the consultant then maybe the consultant will hear me better yeah uh, and uh, the consul uh, the consultant and also the uh, counselor who can talk to you about it in more detail and i would also uh, uh, encourage you to inform your mother about it she can also help you better since you said you could not talk to your mother clearly maybe uh, you can tell her and uh, she can also explain you that these changes are normal at this age and uh, yeah uh, anything else okay. do you want to know about uh i was looking for a surgery doctor oh uh okay you can just fix an appointment for me okay uh thank you for coming today okay I'm gonna. I messed up. I don't know. Actually, <laughs> no. This is a difficult patient. This patient is very difficult. Oh. So you will get, uh, you will get this kind of patients even, uh, even in real life and even in the exam scenario when it's 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 a kind of a patient negotiation. So you, uh, uh, know it is. Uh, you you are not going to suggest surgery. but somehow you have to uh, agree to her concerns that yes what she is thinking is also okay but what we feel is this so what i felt was like you you told the right things but you could obviously you can tell more about uh, the problems with the surgery which were not discussed actually what is the complication that can happen with the uh, surgery uh, to her and i think uh, in bit, in the beginning when she is saying uh, i feel it's very abnormal i'm very stressed uh, there was no response given to her uh, what she said like you said okay and then you went off that that's what i talked about in the beginning of the session is that you have to have an active listening active listening means you listen and then you say okay uh, i'm sorry to see that you are 
feeling that way or i'm sorry to see that you're so much concerned and you're so much stressed about it once you said later on but initially in the beginning uh, there was no response given to what she think so this is a young girl who has a body image problem and she's come to you she's very agitated that nobody is believing her the gps seen her and said nothing there is everything is normal she is very uh, sure of the fact that she is abnormal she is uh, uh, it's affecting her day to day life she has stopped doing her daily activities uh, so all these things you have to you have to understand that uh, again uh, i think it was very uh, uh, what do you say uh, telling you know i will send it to the council again again you have to i say that you cannot decide a treatment for them you have to offer okay i Uh, there is one thing we can do i can many girls at this age you, so you always it is better to say in a third person that many people have this so the many girls have uh, you know have this concern about you know how they appear and how the genitalia or the the labia appear in these cases uh, talking to someone uh, uh, to someone else like a counselor may be helpful you said these things but you know you can just refine how you say it so you say that uh, may be helpful and uh, if you agree you know you should offer you know you should not be especially when you are talking to a younger person uh, and when they are listening to older people they are always you know they 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 rebel or they they think that they will not they are not understanding so always it's, it it seems very patronizing when you say that i want you to do this so you say that i can offer you if you agree i can fix an appointment and make you talk to a counselor which might be help which may help you to understand uh, uh, what you're going through it's it's a way of saying so if if see this station doesn't have much applied clinical knowledge though uh, it it is more about communication it's 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 only a communication and a negotiation with the patient which patient is adamant on one thing and you to explain her that this is what is happening uh, do you get my point like it's more clearer yes, yeah. yeah so so i yeah. have a question in applied clinical knowledge like do we have to ask like these things can genuinely be because of uh, uh, like adrenal hyperplasia or something so do we need to ask about all this pp and any pigmentation anything like that now see in in the it's like, given to you that examination is normal okay normal, so yeah. you can ask it but but if the uh, case examination is normal then it is normal the only thing you can ask her is that has she difficulty in if she uses tampons has she difficulty in putting tampons in if she wear tight fitting clothes is there is a problem which may you know actually show you that oh, maybe it is enlarged to some extent or something so these are things you know functionally is there a problem this is all what she is telling you is all psychological she is saying i feel that it is abnormal i saw some pictures on the net and i feel it is abnormal and i have stopped doing this but actually we are not asked about the functional aspects of it, whether it is actually causing a physical problem to her like if she wears tight fitting clothes does she feel that discomfort she said it would look like that she is more concerned about how it is looking at present so using of tampons wearing tight fitting clothes whether it's affecting her that you have to ask and it is if given in the examination finding is normal so i assume it is normal and then it's more of a negotiation kind of thing is what i understand again in these cases uh, i don't i think i missed in between but did you ask her that whether she felt it was abnormal or somebody else has told yeah i so i told her whether she has shown it to say anyone as she said no i just checked it and i and she tried to tell her mother she has not shown but she was not comf- she was not okay. sure whether her mother understood so no i what i need to say is instead of asking whether she has shown to anybody you should ask her whether anybody has told her that it is abnormal is what i mean to say is like whether it's it's, it's no, her own thing ha uh, okay. so what i mean to say is like somebody else you know it may be grooming it may be sexual abuse or something so these are things you should keep in mind in this case so has somebody else told her? though she tells you i am not sexually active but you should ask specifically uh, the question is whether anybody has told you that it is abnormal or it's uh like you have seen something and uh, what is the reason you think it is abnormal so this is what thing now when you th- say about the internet so she says i saw the pictures on the internet and uh, that's what i think so uh, you you said correctly that it can be variation but you should also tell her that the internet uh, is a good source of information but sometimes it can be misleading is something you will say because uh, many of them are photoshopped or uh, images which have been done up which are not the actual uh, you know picture of how the labia would look like so 
one thing is you say that there is a variation that's correct so you say that uh, the the external uh, genitalia or the labia it can be varied in individuals and all those variations are normal is what you emphasize then you say because she specifically her the her only source of information from her history appears to be from the internet so you say that internet uh, is a good source of information so you so you cannot just neg negate what she is feeling what i mean to say is uh, if you keep negating her that no 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 what you are saying is not correct it is normal and we should just continue it and this 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 then it's like she she doesn't agree and she feels more offended and the negotiation part doesn't happen then she refuses to listen to you so you say that uh, internet is a good source of information but many of the images on the internet and lot of information on the internet can be misleading most of these images which uh, are said to be perfect are photoshopped images and then there is something called as a great wall of vagina which which actually there is a big chart available which has pictures of all many variations of the external uh, genital organs and labia which i can show you and you can see that all of these images are normal variations of normal okay so one you tell her that uh, there is a lot of variation and everything is normal functionality is normal you rule out any functional problem she is having you tell her that the internet can be misleading at times so you sh she should keep that in mind then you talk about uh, it's not and and then the genital cosmetic surgery is not genital mutilation uh, that is not correct so it it's not it's not illegal they do do cosmetic surgery in the form of cosmetic it's not same as genital mutilation but you say that one thing uh, i should tell you about the risk and complication associated with this surgery there can be immediate risk like bleeding infection urinary problems uh, and later on in few cases it has been seen that it can once uh, long term you know there can be loss of sensation because uh, when we do the surgery the some nerves may be destroyed there can be scarring and lead to difficulty or sometimes there is a difficulty in intercourse later on so it can have long term uh sexual sequelae then you say that uh in the young age this kind of surgery is not recommended because you are still growing and the development of these organs is taking place which will take place till the age of 18 and 19 years and uh if we do any surgery now that will interfere with that development that's one thing also you say that this surgery is not funded by the nhs it has it's it's on self payment so all these things you it's like the pros and cons basically the cons of the surgical management you are telling her so you are telling her and then you say that many girls will have this kind of uh, thoughts and concern about the body image and it i have seen that talking to a counselor might help if you agree i can fix an appointment with the counselor and then you can talk about your concerns in a more detailed manner so it's it's all about it's the same thing i am saying the same thing but it's only how you can negotiate with the patient how you can assure her that you are actually helping her in some manner and uh, it's again not trying to tell her that she is wrong is what i mean to say you even if she is wrong you cannot tell her that oh no no everything is wrong what i am saying is correct no you have to have a little common ground in between so give that sexual uh, the uh, the actual factual in information and in this case is yes if you think uh, she says that somebody has told her or my boyfriend is like then talk any 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 concern talk about sexual abuse you can even in this case when I, with this conversation you can ask her i'm sorry to ask some personal question it may sound very intrusive again the same things but i'm concerns i have concerns about the safety i would ask of any patient at any point of time have you been forced to have uh, sex without your consent so this is one thing we should rule out when there when she is adamant on it and she says have, she uh, she is very very concerned not ready to listen to you okay um, yeah one more question in patient safety one of the answer is uh, one of the points is this whether she is sexually active and if she says yes then we ask about like the uh, for the sexual uh, abuse but if she says no then what are what other uh, safety points you have to ask for uh so 
all the safety points is what you are telling her actually the basically safety point is that you know about a social history has somebody told her or so she is being groomed yeah. or abused in some manner that if you ask her that okay has somebody told you or you have uh, uh, you know you are thinking your on your own is one thing whether she is informing her parents or not is again a safety point she said that that means that she has tried to tell her about it. it's not like she has been hiding it so if she is hiding it from her mother and stuff then you all think about the you know that there, there may be some other hidden agenda in this case you know even she saying i'm not sexually active but she may have she may not be sexually active but she may have been assaulted isn't it so so these are the kind of things like the, again from the question itself you will try to understand so that is all patient safety then you are explaining her the risk of surgery the risk of surgery which was missed here so risk of surgery is one thing you need to explain that this is not a just a very simple surgery and it it is not without and she just thinks it is just going to uh, you know correct the abnormality she is facing and there is no risk or complication associated with it. so that is again patient safety that you tell others and then asking about how she is doing at school social circumstances ruling out vulnerable populations is all patient safety that you rule rule out you know she is not a, a person who she doesn't she is living alone or she not going to school and she's in a vulnerable population is again a uh, part of patient safety okay, okay. yeah thank you so these they these are not straight forward uh, sessions you can approach them in any way of life the only thing is that the role player has to be satisfied uh, with you uh, just a moment there are some question uh, so if you okay so examination findings are given so uh, you can say that uh, when you are talking you say that i would like to examine and see and then you say that the exam on examination everything looks fine so at least uh, you complete your template that you you know obviously she is complaining of large labia you need to examine her before you say anything so you say that i have examined you now and the examination findings they uh, look fine okay so here the addressing the patient concern is the most important thing in uh, patient communication so again assure confidentiality assess the chief concerns and try to understand where the patient is coming at so there this involves a bit of empathy on your part to understand the young girl who is doing otherwise well in school and who was she says that she was physically active now this is something which is in her mind which is affecting her quality of life so you have to be empathetic towards her do not make it you against her you you are not entering into a a uh, fight or uh, you know confrontation with the patient so you have to try to understand her and be on her side and still explain to her that what do you think uh, should be done rule out sexual abuse or any grooming assess the social circumstances psychological concern so it's basically patient negotiation okay so as we discussed the points that It, there's a wide variation in appearance of labia on internet and inter internet can be uh, misleading development can go on till 18 to 19 years you, the body is still under transition and uh, if any surgery done at this time may affect that normal growth okay then there are risk to the surgeries which is bleeding infection long term risk like scarring vaginal dryness even dyspareunia loss of sensation and it can be even like it can be actually more harmful than of benefit may need any secondary uh, selective surgery uh, cost is not covered covered by nhs it's like 1000 2000 pounds okay so do not be entirely dismissive of her but give your uh, what you think uh, i think that's it i don't think anything else i have written for that okay so basically ask about any uh, just rule out any physical symptoms like irritation discomfort during any physical activity discomfort in wearing tight fitting clothes and inserting tampons so that shows you if there is any functional pro problem associated with it i think that should be the okay so that brings to our end of this uh, first session i hope uh, it was useful uh, to all of you and sometimes even if we uh, Okay, somebody has asked a question with regards to pregnancy. Do we need to do pregnancy test in all stations? So pregnancy test, yes. If it is three weeks, 
after the at least three weeks after the uh, uh, unprotected sexual intercourse, you will do pregnancy test. If she comes immediately after sexual intercourse, you will advise. Even when you give emergency contraception, definitely you will advise uh, pregnancy test in three to four weeks, unless she gets a period. So she can wait till four weeks. If she gets a period, it's fine. If she doesn't, then should do a pregnancy test. If she comes after, uh, if she says comes after one sexual intercourse and had uh, one three weeks back. Uh, then definitely do one pregnancy test. So that uh, pregnancy test. Now in this case, no. Immediately, I will not do a pregnancy test. If she says I got period uh, nine days back and her periods are regular, but you will advise her emergency contraception and still offer her a pregnancy test after three weeks of this uh, uh, unprotected sexual intercourse. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, it was useful and. I thank you both uh, Nesma and Jyoti for uh, volunteering to present, and I think both of you did a very good job. Uh, you know, speaking in front of so I was not able when I was preparing, I was not able to speak in front of so many people. Uh, a list of recalls. So there is uh, there is no ex exact list of recalls. Uh, the cases definitely are repeated. Uh, and the cases I feel the those who are uh, come recently are repeated more. Like there will be few things which keep on repeating, like ectopic, the like emergency contraception keeps on repeating, uh, maybe in a different form. Um, most of the cases we do in our courses are modified from the cases which have already come. And uh, some of the cases like uh, 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 thrombo that bridging thrombo prophylaxis, which came in our exam in May 2018, was repeated in September and then months later. And there were a few of my friends whom I discussed this bridging thrombo prophylaxis. This was a this was a surprise station in our exam, but then I had discussed with many friends and they it was very useful for them. And then that's why we keep it in our course every time. So yes, they are repeatable. Uh, but yes, some surprise stations may be there. Uh, they may not be repeated exactly in the same form, but most of the topics we know that, okay, these are topics which are, uh, because if you start writing recalls, there is no limit to it because nobody can recall the exact question. So if I write a topic, that doesn't mean anything. That means it may come in any form and it keeps coming. Uh, so just, uh, so anyways, please do not miss uh, the two more sessions coming up with Dr. Mohammed Hassan and Dr. Sidra Ali. Uh, they are part of our uh, mentor team for part three preparation and uh, they do a good job with everyone. Uh, so just to think about the course details very quickly before uh, we pack up. Instructors are myself, Dr. Sidra Ali, Dr. Mohammed Hassan. Uh, Dr. Sidra and Dr. Mohammed Hassan are uh, regular mentors for uh, part two courses. Uh, start date will be around 1st of July. It may change one or two days, but this duration is of four months. So this goes on till October. So in the November exam, this course will continue till October. Uh, fees is 650 pounds and you can pay into installments. If, in, if any problem about joining or the fees, you can directly contact MedExam expert page and 15% uh, discount for those who have enrolled in the course earlier. They are going to be So as I told you, there are module-wise sessions, and there'll be around 100 stations in the course. So you can imagine, like, if you do 100 stations very well, I'm sure you can pass the exam. All the sessions will be recorded, and the recordings are available till the November. Till you give the exam, the recordings will be available. There'll be two difficult topic sessions. There is a new session, which is not mentioned here, which is on templates, which Dr. Mohammed Hassan will be taking. He'll be tell you the templates in the various module and there'll be a telegram group through which for each uh, course mem uh, course and the members of the course are enrolled in the telegram group so we gave uh, keep sending information and people keep asking us questions and uh, in the when you do the actual sessions uh, we uh, once a person presents we invite one of the other audience to actually give feedback first before uh, the mentor give the feedback so that you are 
even if you're not presenting the case you are directly involved in the discussion because not only is when you are present you learn more when you listen to other people please remember that if you listen to the other person and you think analyze critically analyze the other person's presentation uh, the positive and the negative point keep the positives avoid the negatives that 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 that's the best part of preparation also i feel if you do this 100 stations and you make notes and make templates on this 100 stations and you you have a book of 100 stations available with you i think nothing can uh, no book can actually succeed or exceed that okay thanks to everyone for attending this session thanks to you for uh, uh, coming here and uh, listening to me and listening to the people uh, those who ever have participated and those who have listened actively also i thank them uh, all of you stay safe and hope to see you some of you uh, in the course uh, and please uh, join the next two sessions uh, which are on alternate days on sunday and tuesday by excellent mentors dr mohammad hasan dr sidra ali who will be talking on very important things like breaking bad news and patient negotiation thank you so much bye bye